Dear students, in today's lecture, we will start our venture into the applications of environmental microbes. So far, we have been talking about the chemistry of microbes, their metabolism, their functions, their genomes and different kinds of microbes including the bacteria, eukaryotes uh, and archaea and also virus, viroids and prion in the last lecture. In today's lecture, we will look at the first application of in microbes that we get from environment and the first application we are interested in is remediating the problems we have created. So, remediation means finding a remedy for them. Okay? And because microbes are giving us a remedy for our problems, we call it bioremediation. So, bio, bio is remediating our problem. Now, this bioremediation can include many things. Usually, it, in, uh, it is um, referred to as when microbes consume by eating or degrade some pollutant. So, there is a pollutant like hydrocarbon, petroleum and when microbes eat it up and clean it up, we call it bioremediation. That is the usual um, use of the word bioremediation, but the word in itself is much more broad and it includes any time we use microbes to get rid of our problems. So, we will start today by talking about two other kinds of microbes that I did not include in the last lecture and then we will jump into bioremediation and we will start bioremediation by talking about one of the major environmental challenges in the if this century which is the acid mine drainage and the mining problem. Alrighty, so let us get started. Okay, so as I mentioned, we'll start first with uh, the mi other microbes that I did not talk about in the previous lecture, apart from bacteria, virus, viroid, and prion. So we have protozoa and algae. So let's look at their applications and their utility. So um, a protozoa is a eukaryote, but it's a unicellular eukaryote. Usually, when we talk about eukaryotes, the the first impression for many is that oh, we are talking about multicellular life forms such as humans, such as um, moss, fungus, but we have unicellular prokaryotes as well and if you remember from your class 6 uh, science, you must have learnt about amoeba or class 6 or class 8 science, you must have learnt about amoeba, that is a protozoa. So, protozoa is unicellular which means it is a single cell organism, it is highly specialized. So, unlike bacteria, it can not only do the essential functions of life, but it has some very interesting novel features. For example, most protozoa can actually engulf bacteria digest them and eat them. So, it actually has an ingestion, digestion and even excretion process. So, in this sense it uh, resembles multicellular organisms, but it is obviously uh, different from multicellular life forms. It is ecologically diverse. So, you will find different kinds of protozoa present in different kinds of environment, but it is limited to narrow environmental range. Now, please note that the archaea is uh, are quite prevalent in environment and they are usually found in extreme environments like let us say oligotrophic environment, high pressure, high temperature, highly acidic, highly alkaline environment, but also in they are ubiquitous in nature elsewhere. For example, we have archaea growing in soil, right? We have some archaea in our drinking water distribution system. Bacteria on the other hand are ubiquitous, they are present everywhere. Now, protozoa are more limited in where they are found to thrive. So, some protozoa that we have, obviously we have protozoa that thrive in our body, many of them are pathogens. So, we are very interested in them and here you have some pathogenic protozoa and look how different their morphology is. So, enter amoeba histolytica, it causes, do you know what it causes? It causes amoebic dysentery and this is endemic in many parts of our country right now, at least I know from where I come, Uttar Pradesh. We, this is uh, entamoeba histolytica related infections are en, uh, endemic and one of the issues we have with this infection is that this protozoa is getting um, resistant to the antimicrobials we use to kill it. And the other problem with protozoan diseases my dear students is that because they are eukaryotic many drugs that kill them. So, let us say I have protozoan infection, let us say I have entamoeba histolytica infection, so I have amoebic dysentery. And it is not a very pleasant experience, but I take metronidazole or tenedazole to heal myself. Now, these drugs, they not only hurt the uh, protozoa, but because the protozoa is eukaryote, they also affect my system because I am also, my human cells are also eukaryotic. So, we cannot overdose the antimicrobials used against protozoa. Then you have Trypanosoma gambians and then you have Leishmania causes Leishmaniasis, really bad disease and Leishmania tropica and Trichomonas vaginalis causes veg, uh, disease in vagina. 
you have giardia causes really bad uh, disease of st flu of stomach you have plasmodium vivax now plasmodium vivax causes malaria you have toxoplasmic gondii and balantidium coli so different morphologies causing different diseases now how do we prevent these uh, enteric protozoa enteric means the ones that are inside us well they are usually food borne and they have a very strong oral fecal route so if we can put a stop to oral fecal route if we can ensure the safety and um, sterility of our food then it is not a problem we do not get the diseases so um, the way it f we in humans get infected is we drink contaminated water protozoa proliferate in our body and then we excrete them they go in sewage or wastewater in India we do not have a very good sewage collection system in most part of the country and wherever we do we have issues with wastewater treatment and then the contaminated water contaminates the environment which contaminates animals which contaminates our pets which contaminates our food oh no pets do not contaminate our food but all the in contaminated environment contaminates all of them and we get exposed to all three if we eat meat we get from livestock if we are um, if you have domestic pets we might get diseases from them uh, protozoan diseases and if we eat contaminated food then we get um, we can get say protozoan diseases from them now with in case of plasmodium Vivax or falciparium, either of the malarial parasites, this is not how the transmission works. The transmission is um, vector borne, so it is water related disease, but it, but it is vector borne. So, what it implies is that it requires a vector for transmission. Here, it is direct ingestion. So, if I ingest contaminated food, then I get sick, right? But in plasmodium, it, it requires m the mosquito to breed in water get the catch the sickness and then carry the plasmodium protozoa and infect a healthy animal healthy human being and then carry it forward and, and the disease spreads so um, for but, but for others mostly it is oral fecal route for this it is plasmodium it is vector borne already now here is the thing if you do not want to fall sick to protozoa it does not mean you stop eating food does not mean you stop having pets does not mean that you stop eating meat what does it what it does mean is that you maintain some san, uh, some um, um, sanitation and the place where we really need to focus is sewage and wastewater treatment for most developed countries these these diseases are, are not an issue entamoeba histolytica is i don't know if there's an outbreak of entamoeba histolytica in any developed country right now but in india it's endemic and what i mean by that is that right now in india there are pockets that have severe infestation with entamoeba histolytica because our sewage and wastewater treatment facility is really bad. So where we need to focus is here in sewage and wastewater. Interestingly after I am done with bioremediation I will be picking up wastewater treatment and we will be talking about wastewater microbiology where you will get to understand more about wastewater treatment. So uh, stay alert and keep tuned. Alrighty. Now how um, now again coming back to protozoa diseases how to avoid them we can first need to detect and treat infected people because remember if you look at this diagram the, inf the infected people if not treated will multiply the copies of protozoa which will go through their fecal matter and infect other people. We need to improve environmental sanitation and in large part of it is wastewater treatment and we need to avoid ingestion of infected, infected cysts by personal protection, pr protection. So we need to wash our hands before we eat, we need to clean, drink clean water. Okay, So this is all about protozoa for now. And then uh, as we go through different environmental challenges, if protozoa plays a role in them, we will talk about protozoa again. Now let us look at algae. Algae again, eukaryote, um, but it needs to be studied separately because it is a photosynthetic eukaryote. So basically it is uh, it's like a plant, but it is not a plant. So what algae can do is it takes sunlight, produces food doing uh, using photosynthesis and then it is consumed by zooplankton which are consumed by birds and fishes and then fishes are consumed by homo sapiens some birds are also consumed by homo sapiens so eventually the algae contributes to human food in a long way there are some algae in some parts of the world that are eaten so we directly consume algae too so algae are very uh, intimately linked with our human uh, health okay but this is not all about algae there is more about algae too algae in recent decades have uh, proven to be a promising source of energy and a promising source of organic matter for doing different things. So let us look here, algal bacterial consortium based bioeconomy. So we have developed 
we are developing and we have developed a consortium of algae and bacteria that can do different kinds of jobs for us. For example, they can clean our sewage for us, they can remediate our contaminants for us. So, we can use them in wastewater treatment and bioremediation. We use them in environmental technology when we are trying to get more energy, make green energy or other things. We use them for bloom control. Right. So, if there is an algal bloom in the lake and we need to control it and if we add the right bacteria, if we add the right kind of algae, we might be able to restrict the bloom. Also, uh, algae and bacteria depending on how they are growing and how much feed they can generate, they can also be used for aquaculture feed and feeding animals. There is a lot of application right now in biotechnology, in biorefinery and algal fuels. Remember that because some algae under stress will store lipids in their body and this lip these lipids can be used as fuels. Okay, so here is another diagram on the right which is showing how wastewater treatment, fertilizer, energy and carbon dioxide cycle can be matched with algal biomass and this can help us generate more sustainable forms of energy, clean our water more sustainably, get good source of fertilizer sustainably. Let us move on. Now, now we are moving on to bioremediation, so let us go really slow and let me tell you about uh, when I talk about bioremediation as I mentioned in the introduction we are using the bio for finding remedy for our problems. So, I know the popular understanding of bioremediation right now is well when a microbe or microbes are eating pollutants bioremediation, but that is only one form of bioremediation. So, what I want to start with is mining. Definitely for gold, for silver and to some extent for copper, we have already went past the peak production. So, these me metals, these ores which are highly valuable, so all our electronic circuits are copper, the jewelry is gold, gold is also used for medicine, gold is also used in research, same as with silver, it is a very powerful antimicrobial, it is used in many different forms of research and different kinds of activities, it is also a precious metal that is used in jewelry. So, um, gold and silver including copper, these are very, very important for our human activities and not just them even iron and other things, but for these metals we know that we have passed the peak production. So, what it implies is that we are not going to produce gold, silver, copper anytime again in that abundant quantity as we were doing earlier. So, basically we have exhausted the rich resources, the rich mines, rich ores on our globe and the ones that are still there will not be able to meet the, um, will not be able to meet the same production rate as we were doing earlier. So, in this case, now that our rich ores are almost depleted, <laughs> we have to go back to the poorer ores, the ores that have much lesser quantity of the metal in them. Now, it is not economically feasible that if you are mining metals from core that are ores that are less that have less than 5 percent of the metal in them, it is not economically feasible. So, earlier people used to waste it, okay, just waste. But now, using microbes, we can actually leach out the metal and then concentrate it and we not only 5 percent, but we can go to ores that have up to 0.3 percent of metal like 0.3 percent copper, 0.3 percent gold and then get our precious metal out of it and still make a profit. So, how does this work? Well, this works very simply. Metals, these metals have a quality that if they are washed with acidic media, they will dissolve in the acidic media. This is how we concentrate them. Now, how do you make acidic media and how do you dissolve them? This is catalyzed and um, driven by microbes. So, let us look into it. So, in this slide, let us read this out. It used to be that ores containing less than 5 percent copper were not worth mining, but with current demand geologists are now looking for ores with 0.3 percent copper. That is very little copper. They are even looking in mining waste slurries from 10 or 20 years ago which still have 0.4 percent or 0.5 percent copper because mining processes were not as efficient back then what was once a waste is now a mine. So, this is from an article that I have copied and on the right you have a picture which is um, the al algae actually not just bacteria, but algae that is feasting on copper sulphide on a black rock and thus you have these beautiful green and blue formation. So, how does this mining business work when it comes to microbes? How do microbes help us uh, extract metal from such low concentration ores, ores that 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 that is very less. Earlier even 5 percent was less than 5 percent, 5 percent was not economically feasible. So, the way we do it is that we accumulate all the waste, the low percent um, um, ores and then 
when they have been isolated they are put in a drainage system when they are drenched with an aqueous solution that allows bacteria to grow. So, when bacteria grow in this aqueous solution they do their electron donation electron acceptance, uh, acceptance business and they lower the pH. When they lower the pH they, f um, they uh, allow the dissolution of copper. So, usually if you know if you remember from your chemistry in 11th 12th class and from your geography most of the ores are reduced form of metals. So, you will have iron sulphide and many of the ores are actually pyrites. So, you remember copper pyrite, iron pyrite. So, these are pyrites and pyrites means they are sulphide. Now, we have sulphur oxidizing bacteria that will oxidize sulphur, make sulphur dioxide and you will get sulfuric acid, sulfurous acid which reduce the pH drastically. So, if we can convert sulphide into sulphate or sul sulphite that will in the presence of aqua it will become sulfurous acid or sulfuric acid and the metal will dissolve and it will leach out. So, we use metal leaching and we reduce by uh, dissolve by uh, washing it with less with highly acidic media and we reduce the pH of the aqueous media by letting the microbes oxidize the ores. So, I took this waste here I put it in a bath and this bath allows sulfur oxide oxidizing microbes to flourish. When they flourish so this iron pyrite or copper pyrite which is CUS or Fe2S this uh, FAS2, so what this is done, this is oxidized by the bacteria and it produces sulfuric acid. Now, what does sulfuric acid do? It washes away the metal, so you have copper washing away. So, the sulfuric acid produced by microorganisms help release the metals in the rock. Now, the high copper grade liquid solution released by process is diverted to a tank where we do a recovery through subsidence. Okay. So, these are other, other pictures from USA and they are from the original there by the original Dr. Brock researcher. So, here you have low grade copper ore that is being um, uh, leached out using iron oxidizing bacteria. So, in many uh, times copper and iron many copper and iron ores actually coexist. So, this is one of those mines and this is your typical leach dump and here we try to maximize the surface area and thus we have different steps as you see here. Now, we have uh, pipes that pipes that go through and they distribute the acidic leach water over the surface of the pile and um, acidic water will slowly percolate down and it will wash away from here and when it washes you see this uh, well really dark green this is rich in copper and this is the effluent and here this effluent is the copper rich effluent is being passed over metallic iron and here you have a small pile of copper that you have extracted. Okay, So, um, the way this copper iron reaction works is very beautiful, let us take a look. So, remember we arranged the copper, the poor quality copper sulphide and you have put the poor quality copper sulphide here and you are sprinkling acidic solution on it. And copper, uh, they, this, this reaction, the first reaction oxidation of copper sulphide happens both chemically and biologically. So, you have microbes that are oxidizing copper pyrite and making cupric ion and sulphate ion. And then uh, copper pyrite also reacts with iron and is present with iron and sulphate and low pH, so a lot of H. And because of this, the copper gets dissolved. And when copper gets dissolved, you can send it to the recovery part. So, in recovery of copper metal, you have, you have iron, ferrous, you have cupric, and then you reduce the copper, oxidize the iron, right? And then you have copper metal that makes a small pile here, which is this. On the other hand, how do you make the acidic solution? Now, this is this reaction helps make acidic solution and it uses the leftover ferric ion uh, from here, it con ferrous ion sorry, it converts it into ferric ion. In this process, it makes um, and this water is recycled here by an H2SO4 is added separately to make it acidic. So, this is all again met, uh, catalyzed by microbes. So, this is your ferrous ion, it is being oxidized and made ferric ion. So, these are iron oxidizing bacteria. So, note here we have copper oxidizing bacteria or we can say sulfur oxidizing bacteria and we have iron oxidizing bacteria. Both together make sure that we separate copper from iron and we need to just add more acid. Okay. Now, there is the second part of this metal leaching. The first part is making it, making it economically feasible and attractive for us to even mine metals from very poor quality ores by using biologically driven chemical reactions. 
On the other hand, when we are mining, let's say in India, it's a big problem. In many parts of US, it's a recognized big problem. In India, we don't talk much about it though. When we mine, we are exposing the minerals that are that have been for thousands and I don't know how many years put under away from oxygen in an anoxic zone in an anaerobic zone. Now we are exposing them to oxygen. When we do that, they start getting oxidized, right? And the microbes that are oxidized metals, they become very happy because now they have oxygen to uh, to get more energy because oxygen is the best electron acceptor for them. So they also start thriving the metal oxidizing microbes and the metals are chemically also getting oxidized. So we have a very fast biochemical um, oxidation of metals. Now when they ha get oxidized, they are usually soluble in water. So if there is a groundwater stream, if there is an aquifer nearby, it is very likely or there is a surface water stream, it is very likely that the leachate of the mine, let us say there is a rain or there is just water passing through the mine or we are washing, you know there is a washing step when people do mining. So that gets very um, rich in metals because now the metals have oxidized and they have uh, they are being in acidic media they are getting dissolved first thing because most okay uh, let me break this down for you Alright dear students, so in your ores you have typically metal sulphides that you are interested in mining and typically it is an anaerobic zone and when you, um, when you start mining it you expose it to oxygen and thus oxygen comes in and what was an anaerobic zone earlier now is, now has presence of oxygen. So two beautiful things happen, first thing that happens is that uh, there is a biologic, the microbes that are very happy to oxidize sulphide, they come into picture. So you have sulphide oxidizing microbes that would love to make sulphate out of it because oxygen is present and they will derive good amount of energy which they can channelize for growth and for sustenance. So biological oxidation. The other thing that happens is because the metal is now being exposed directly to oxygen, metal will automatically undergo oxidation. So there is a chemical oxidation of metal. Now sulphide in itself is highly reduced, so it is very vulnerable and susceptible to oxidation. So sulphide also undergoes oxidation, chemical oxidation. Now you have two problems, when the um, sulphide undergoes oxidation, you have sulphate. Now sulphate is a very acidic ion, so you have lot of H plus that will increase in your water, right, in the aquifer ground water or in the surface water. When that happens, the pH drops, so here the pH will drop. Now in excess of hydrogen ions, in, ex in excess of uh, low pH, what happens is we have more dissolution of metal. So because of pH dropping, we have what problems do we have? Problem number one, we have more metals in water, more metals dissolved in water and lot of heavy metals and met excess metal in water is not good for health, it is not good for environment. The second problem is our surface water or ground water is acidic. And if it is acidic enough and usually with addition of sulphate, it does get very low in very low in pH, it is harmful for life in all forms. It corrodes the rocks, it corrodes pipes and it destroys the aquatic system. So it is hazardous, both are hazardous. Now this is not just from sulphur oxidation, but even the chemical oxidation of metal will promote further addition of metal in the water because oxidized versions of metal oxidized forms of metals are usually not for all but usually more soluble in water. So we have higher metals in water not only because of drop in pH but also because of chemical oxidation of metals. So there are two sources of elevated pH level. So now we have water that is very that has very high amount of heavy metals and metals and very low pH. Now this problem this water it will go and it will drain 
on surface or underground and either way it is going to damage the geography, it is going to damage the ecosystems and it is going to damage the microbes. And if we use this water as source of drinking water, it is going to affect the quality of the drinking water that is supplied to the community. So, this problem overall, this destruction of the water quality and this deterioration of water quality because of metals leaching into water and because of p lowering of pH which help more metal leach into the water is called as acid mine drainage. Acid mine drainage. So, let us look into acid mine drainage. So, on the left, this is a picture of a remediation site where people are trying to uh, reduce acid mine drainage. But if you look carefully, this is a beautiful forest area and there is a stream moving here. And the color, this is not the color of mud, this is the metals, the copper metal that have that are excess in the water and are giving and iron also, copper and iron both that are giving it this reddish and greenish color. This water is highly acidic, if you step in you will get burned. So, this river is practically dead despite its levels of oxygen being ok, but nothing can, so no fishes will survive, only acidophilic microbes will survive in it and metal tolerant microbes will survive in it. Ok, how does this acid mine drainage happen? So, for acid mine drainage, usually we have sulphide minerals because remember it is acid mine drainage, so the pH needs to go down and it is not just oxidation of metals that allows metals to dissolve, but it is a low pH that really promotes the dissolution of metals. So, you, the best way to lower the pH is have sulphide oxidized into sulphate or sulphite. So, sulphide uh, minerals we have them here the black ones and the oxidation rate depends upon the type of mineral. So, if it is iron pyrite or copper pyrite or uranium pyrite, so it depends on that. It depends on the surface area, if there is more surface area for chemistry, the dissolution will be faster. It depends on the crystallinity, we are, we, in one of the research that I was involved in, we found out it is not just the percentage crystallinity of the mineral, but it is also the kind of crystal it is making, the kind of geometry the mineral has. That also impacts its oxidation rate. So, which is morphology, it depends on composition, it is depends on assemblage, how they have assembled together. All this determines how much oxygen is present here for metal to get oxidized it, and which depends on the pore space. It also depends on how much water is present for to dissolve the metal, how much uh, ferric ions are being pr produced, how much neutralizing minerals are present. It is quite possible that we have some alkaline mineral here like lime and that um, resist dissolution of water just by reducing uh, increasing pH. So, all and temperature makes a difference, the pH makes a difference. So, all these factors will affect the oxidation rate and dissolution of metal into the water. Now, once it has dissolved, how will it, what are the factors that will affect the drainage of the water? You have the rain, how much precipitation is received, what is the evaporation of precipitation, what is the thermal convection, how much is the surface flow, how much is the runoff, how much is the unsaturated flow, how much is saturated flow, how much oxygen is entering in, what is the seepage, what is the infiltration of water, what are the uh, aquifer. Uh, design, you know, the layout of aquifer, the slope, all these factors will affect the slope or uh, the flow of uh, or the drainage of acid mine water, acidic mine water. And then, so here we have aquifer, it depends on the flood plain, so what um, flood plain we are in, runoff, climate, all these things will affect how much uh, dissolved metals and acidic water will spread to what extent. Together, this problem is acid mine drainage. Now, um, how does acid mine drainage work? What is its chemistry? Let us read out some basic things about acid mine drainage. Acid mine drainage refers sometimes as AMD, just abbreviating it, results when a mineral pyrite is exposed to air and water results in formation of sulfuric acid and the metal oxide. Okay, and this is usually present in coal. So, we have often, even if you are mining coal, we are not mining metal, but because there is iron pyrite present, co present with the coal, the iron pyrite will oxidize and make sulfur dioxide and uh, sulfuric acid and create problems. Um, it occurs when surf during surface mining the overlying rocks are broken and removed to get the coal. It also occurs in deep mines because it allows now the entry of oxygen to pyrite bearing coal seams. The products of AMD are acidity and iron can devastate water resources by lowering the pH coating stream bottoms with iron hydroxide forming the familiar orange colored yellow boy 
so this is how they call them in uh, us areas with abandoned mine drainage many areas also contain naturally occurring limestone which neutralize acidity to determine whether or not a mine will create acidic drainage coal companies must analyze how much pyrite and neutralizers are present in the rock which will be disturbed by mining and then people can determine whether we should go ahead and do mining or not so this is applicable in us but similar process should be applicable in india too now before we enter bioremediation my dear students i would like to take pause here and give you what is the biological approach to treating acid mine drainage so remember acid mine drainage is happening because our metals are getting oxidized and our metals are getting oxidized because they're getting exposed to um they're getting exposed to oxygen and the ph is lowering down as they get oxidized so they get further dissolved and just one thing leads to another and then we have heavy metals in water and you have very acidic uh, ph water now in order to remediate this what people have done is that they have added biomass so you can add biomass such as bagasse and into the um, near the mines you can make layers of bagasse and you can introduce or you can in create uh, conditions that will encourage sulfate reducing microbes so one of the problem with uh, acid mine drainage is production of sulfate if we can contain this we will allow the ph not to fall we will allow the dissolution to be limited dissolution of metals so in order to contain this what we need to do is in order to contain sulfate levels we need to have some reversing activity something like this now in order to reverse sulfate and make sulfide out of it we need anaerobic conditions and we need sulfate reducing microbes all right so anaerobic conditions and sulfate reducing microbes so uh, to create anaerobic conditions we dose it with some very good electron donor so lot of biomass and some easy to eat uh, electron donor such as acetate or lactate and when they initially eat up we have lot of heterotrophic ground in which set the microbial community running and then they can eat the other waste organics that you have put there and then we want to increase uh, in, in, encourage sulfate reducing microbes because it is going to anaerobic conditions so oxygen will be depleted once oxygen is depleted it will go for other electron uh, acceptors eventually it will reach for sulfate and there is plenty of sulfate present so it will reduce sulfate and make sulf uh, sulfur or sulfide out of it in when this happens the mineral again stabilizes right it innovate is sequestration of metal it stabilizes itself and it's no longer dissolved in water so this is one technique in which people have approached biological technique with which people have approached to um, address acid mine drainage problem now let's say i tell you that there is uh, an acid mine drainage problem in bihar and parts of up how are you going to uh, microbiologically how are you going to approach this problem and solve it so think about it and when we upload the next lecture keep your eyes open and i will teach you how we can use the microbiological tools that you have learned in previous lectures to um, understand what's happening in an acid mine uh, drainage problem understand the effect the toxic effects on ecosystem on public health and then when you are remediating by adding biomass and by adding um, the electron donor not necessarily biomass but definitely the electron donors and lot of uh, food for microbes to eat how, when you remediate how do you track whether the remediation is happening or not so in the next class i'll be teaching you all that so stay tuned thank you